This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. I'm Joe Colan in Peterborough, learning how to help our bees. And I'm Neil Cairns in London, looking forward to the next major mission to what's called our sister planet, Venus. Bees pollinate a third of our food and 80% of flowering plants. But they're under threat from climate change, toxic pesticides, disease, and increasing habitat loss. I'm in Peterborough to learn about a simple method that could be part of the route to saving our bees. This is kind of how it looked before we intervened here. Right. Bug Life is a UK-wide organisation dedicated to the conservation of bees, pollinators and all other invertebrates. So tell me about this meadow. So this is Hollywell Ponds and this is an area that is a wildlife site, but the meadow had become very degraded and then a whole army of volunteers came out here and sowed seed on the ground. At the right time of year, it looks absolutely fantastic, it's full of flowers. And I say, now we just need to try and find some. <laughs> oh, here we go. Yeah, so there's some mallow here. And uh, ragwort's usually quite good for pollinators for doing a fit count. So what work happens in this meadow today? It's called a, a pollinator fit count. Um, and basically, it's a very easy way for anybody to get involved in monitoring the number of pollinators. So it drapes this over the area. And every time an insect visits these flowers, we record it. Unfortunately, we could be in for quite a long way. <laughs> oh, and we have got, here we are, we've got a bug on here. Oh, yes. Carrying out some pollination, so that's an other insect. There's yeah, another there hoverfly. Hoverfly, see it coming yep. in? There's a bee on that plant there. Because it all goes into a database by people doing it all over the country, and then they can average it out and see how our pollinators are doing. Let's find a good spot for our fit count. And again, just to remind ourselves, what's the importance of keeping our pollinator populations healthy? They're incredibly important to us. Roughly one in three of every mouthful of food we eat depends on pollination to some extent. Virtually every piece of fruit is so are tomatoes and aubergines and peppers and beans and peas. The beauty of our countryside, eight out of 10 of our wildflowers would disappear within a matter of about five years. It's estimated that pollinators are worth over 600 million pounds per annum to the UK farming economy. That does really put it into perspective, doesn't it? The service provided by pollinators is not only essential to human life, but also to the natural world. It goes all the way up that food chain of disaster, really, if we lose pollinators. Of the UK's 270 bee species, 126 are now listed as scarce with 17 at risk of extinction. Much of this due to habitat loss. What kind of degradation are we looking at in the UK over the last few decades? Since the Second World War, we have lost 97% of the wildflower-rich land in this country. Now, that's an area roughly one and a half times the size of Wales. That's a huge, huge area of pollinator food that's been lost. And the end result of it is that most of the good bits that are left are little isolated pockets, like almost pollinator zoos. And there's no way to get from one to the other for the poor pollinators. And this is why we need a solution for it. And this is kind of the ethos behind bee lines. Bee 
Lines is a nationwide initiative bringing together a myriad of conservation and volunteering groups to create an interconnected system of wildflower insect pathways across the UK. There's a lot of science behind bee lines. First of all, we map the places that are really good for pollinators on a local basis, usually on a county level. We draw imaginary lines on maps to join them up to start to put that connectivity back in there. So Central Park is actually on the Peterborough Bee Line. Last year, Bug Life worked with the Peterborough Council to plant a 200 square metre stretch of wildflowers bordering the city's flagship park. And as you can see, they have now cut it. OK. <laughs> Typical. So does cutting it down encourage it to grow back up? Yes, particularly the annuals, and quite a lot of these are annuals. So we've got things like the corn marigold, blue cornflowers. Those are all annuals. Now, poppy seed will sit in ground for about 100 years, but it's an annual, and if that ground doesn't get disturbed, they don't come up. And that's why they all came up during the First World War, because of all the trench digging and the bombs going off. Disturbed the ground, up came the poppies everywhere. <laughs> But the perennials, which there are some of in here, one of the daisy family, yeah. they will come back up whether you disturb the ground or not. Chopping stuff down does seem like it's the wrong thing to do, but meadow needs management. You know, naturally meadow would be grazed. I don't think they can really put a herd of sheep into the park. <laughs> do you keep a record as, as this gets mapped out? You're following it sort of around the country as these pockets get yes, created? Yes, basically, if you do something, you can upload it onto the map. If we do something, we upload it onto the map. As soon as you've got around 10% of a bee line in place in the form of stepping stones, it will become active. And are you noticing that through the fit count data that you're receiving, these are helping to see an increase in pollinators? The most recent fit counts showed a rough doubling of bee numbers on average across the city between this year and last year. So that's a very, very positive sign. Definitely, it's, yeah, It's double. early days to say how much of it's down to this and how much might be down to a particularly good year climatically or a bad year climatically. But it's very, very wow. promising that things are starting to pick up. And tomorrow, we are going to be doing some planting here. So you can start to see how these bits join up together. And we'll have made another great bit of pollinator connection. I have a feeling you're about to put me to work tomorrow, Paul. That's the idea. <laughs> I'll come prepared. Where are you, Ellie's? <laughs> An important part of the Beeline initiative is to spread the message that everyone should get involved, from letting your lawns grow to garden and community wildflower spaces and even herb plants on windowsills. There is now more pollinator diversity in our urban landscape than in our rural landscape. We've gone very much monoculture out in the countryside, whereas in the urban landscape, people have at least got gardens and garden plants. So Paul has gathered together some volunteers this morning here at one of the local sports centres. So let's find out what's going on. I think one of the Beeline hookups is about to happen. So it's a really important part of a big national picture that you're taking part in. And we're really hopeful that we will be able to deliver one of the first bits of completed beeline in the country through Peterborough. Right, so we want to come over and grab ourselves some cones. That's it, then fill your cone up with the seeds and go off and find yourself one of these areas and start seeding it. A gentle little sprinkle on the ground. Where are these seeds from, Paul? Well, they've come from a wildflower seed provider. It's a mixture of annuals, perennials and grasses. And um, the reason for having that kind of mixture there is because in year one, you get a lovely display from the annuals. After that, the annuals will disappear unless the ground gets disturbed and the perennials will come into play. So now we need to go and find an area uh, where these poles are that hasn't already been sown. Yeah. It's a bit thick, but... <laughs> <laughs> a bit heavy-handed. So spread them out a bit. You're going to put some more in as well, yeah? If you plant them too close together, only a few of them end up surviving, whereas if you spread them out more, you'll get more of them actually survive. While some of us are better at following instructions, enthusiasm is important too. Oh, all at once. There's more. You can spread them out down here, look. Very enthusiastic spreading of seeds there. Paul, what's the advantage of getting community volunteers and citizen scientists involved? It's about local ownership. They're going to respect this space more and they're going to understand why it's happened far more than if we just come in and plant meadows everywhere. 
really quite fascinated what's been happening and yeah. how they're doing it and what they're doing it for. So have now you... I can see why they've not cut the lawn. <laughs> I was about to ask you, have you put anything on your window box or on your balcony or in your garden differently? To I, help I, have, I have a beautiful lavender bush um, that was in plant pots that wasn't really doing very much. So I actually planted it in the garden and it's absolutely flourished beautifully. But also I've not cut the grass as much and it's lovely to sort of like have the wildlife coming in the garden. Paul, why is this work necessary? Creating bee lines, putting that connectivity back there is absolutely essential for certainly the continuation of the kind of lifestyle that people are used to. It would be a very dull and boring world if we were to lose our pollinators. You'd go back to just having things like conifers and ferns, like it was in prehistoric days before all this wonderful abundance of florid beauty was created. And in many ways, the bee lines are like the motorways for pollinators. And of course, after motorways, you still need the bee roads and the sea roads, which is why even if you're not on a bee line, you can still do and should do something to make a difference for pollinators. But if you're on a bee line, you should do everything you can to try and make sure that that stepping stone is in place, that that line starts to function, that our pollinators can move around the country and continue to provide all that lovely food that we enjoy. Okay, everybody, it's now time to go stamping. So you can get all that aggression out by going and stamping on the ground and just pushing your seeds into the ground. Just a little thing can make a huge difference. And if we all make that little step, you would make one huge big step for nature. Sort out the bugs and the other things will sort themselves out. on our YouTube channel. Search for Razor Science Show and it will take you straight there. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button for notifications. How will your world change today? What happens here? What happens there? Or what you make happen for yourself? If it matters to you, it matters to us too. Your stories are the stories that need to be told. Africa Live, find your voice. Events have consequences. Words create impact. Unprecedented scenes that we saw. Hello, the cleanup operation is now well and truly underway. Parts of southern Europe remain in a state of emergency. Context gives meaning. People make history. Far more than a thousand people have come here today. But authorities are still on high alert. So now we've actually become the border on this road. A complex world demands a comprehensive view. But with the cleanup efforts more or less under control, the economic impact is bound to ripple across the country. There's plastic pollution everywhere. Because the world today matters for your world tomorrow. This is the living area of the crew. The focus is family on future technologies. Well, this is something completely different. The world today, every day on CGTN.
ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos? And unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with Global Business, only on CGTS. The Dead Sea Scrolls are among the most important archaeological discoveries ever made. The majority were found in caves by the Dead Sea in the West Bank in the 1940s and 50s. They contained some of the oldest known versions of books of the Hebrew Bible and other texts such as calendars, legal documents and hymns, some dating back more than 2,200 years. A few scrolls were found almost intact, but there are 25,000 fragments from up to a thousand different manuscripts most made from animal skin, a puzzle that researchers have struggled to solve for decades. Genetic analysis may hold the answer. A team of researchers from Israel, the US and Sweden have applied advanced DNA testing to 26 scroll fragments. While some DNA analysis was carried out in the 1990s, techniques were limited at the time. The new research uses deep sequencing technology which reveals the specific sequence of four chemical building blocks of an organism's DNA and can be used to create a genetic fingerprint. This indicates where the samples came from the same animal and therefore most likely the same document. Samples were compared to the genomes of 10 animal species. 24 were found to be from sheep and the remaining two from cows. Cattle are not normally bred in the arid region where the squirrels were found suggesting the materials originated further afield than previously thought. One of the findings was that four fragments, believed by some to be part of the same manuscript from the Book of Jeremiah, were actually from separate sources, as two were made from cowhide and two from sheephide. Coupled with other clues from the content, this suggests there were different versions of biblical texts circulating in different areas. The team hope to continue studying the Dead Sea Scrolls with the aim of revealing more of their mysteries in the future. Venus is our closest neighbour and the brightest body in the night sky after the moon. It's believed that it formed at the same time as the Earth, condensing from a cloud of gas around 4.5 billion years ago. Both planets are similar in size, mass, density, and volume. But there, the similarities end. The very first picture from another planet was from a Russian probe on the surface of Venus. And it found this incredibly inhospitable world. It's completely covered in clouds. Um, you know, it doesn't have oceans. It has this big, thick atmosphere, hot atmosphere. So a really, really different planet to the Earth. It's a bit like being one kilometre down the sea, like a big, dense swimming pool that's also as hot as a domestic oven. Spacecraft that have reached the surface of this planet have only survived for a few hours. And observations from orbit are difficult due to dense clouds. As a result, we currently only know about as much about Venus as we did about Mars in the 1970s. But two new NASA missions and one from the European Space Agency aim to change that. Professor Richard Gale is leading the European Space Agency's Envision mission, fulfilling a lifetime curiosity about our nearest neighbour. I remember at primary school writing a story uh, you know, about Venus and what we knew. Um, and my mum still has the book somewhere where I, where I did that. It has just been my passion all the way through to understand this place. I think the selection of the NASA missions and Envision is a reflection that the space agencies have started to recognise that Venus needs a programme like Mars has in order to really understand it. And, and until we go and do that, we only think we know the answers, we don't really know anything. Venus was long thought to be a dead planet of little interest. We thought we understood Mars. We thought 
you know, we have all these pictures of the surface. Nothing's happened for four billion years. It was interesting early on, and that was it. And we thought the same on Venus. We thought we understand Venus. Um, we have all these data, but they're, and they're telling us that Venus is, is static. And what we've learned since is that Mars is nothing like that, and it's much, much more interesting. Mariner 2 lifted off and began its three and a half month journey to Venus. In 1962, Venus was the first planet to be successfully visited by spacecraft. The Russian Venera probes and US Mariner missions brought back data of high winds and a dense atmosphere of 95% carbon dioxide. The Magellan NASA flyby in 1990 sent back low quality images of the surface from orbit. It took another 16 years for a new mission to blast off, the Venus Express in 2006, which focused on the planet's atmosphere and in 2010, the Japanese Akutsuki probe launch. Venus Express detected probably volcanic activity ongoing and certainly in the recent past and has shown us the atmosphere is very dynamic, much more dynamic than we would expect for a dead planet. And so we fully expect to find a lot more interest when we, when we look in more, much more detail. Professor Gale and his team believe that from learning more about Venus, we will also gain a wealth of knowledge about Earth. Geologist Dr. Philippa Mason is lead scientist on the mission. It's very similar to the Earth in many respects, and yet so tremendously different. How it's come to evolve to the way it is, is something that we don't yet understand fully. Venus may have been the first habitable world in the solar system complete with an ocean and Earth-like climate. With this in mind, the mission aims to find insights into the potential future of Earth's atmosphere. The climate on Earth is very closely interrelated with and by the geology. We understand how the water and carbon are cycled. In, in the bigger picture, the big sense, we don't really know how fragile the climate actually is. It may be more fragile than we, we realise even now, and it, it may be less. If we put too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and it, it doesn't need much, I think it's somewhere around 3%, then you get a runaway effect and, and the water vapour never condenses in the atmosphere. You know, at the moment it condenses at the top of our troposphere, you get, you get the cirrus clouds and things like that. That wouldn't happen, and, and the, the water vapour gets into the upper atmosphere and then it's lost to space and you get this continuous runaway greenhouse effect and you lose your oceans and Earth turns into Venus. The data gathered from this mission will also help scientists to understand more about Earth-sized planets outside our solar system, exoplanets. The history of the Earth and our arrival and the, you know, the, the spontaneous arrival of life is so so improbable on Earth, it's an extraordinary thing. This need to try and understand why Earth has ended up the way it has compared to Mars and Venus. You could consider Venus as being our nearest equivalent of an exoplanet. It may be like many others that we see beyond the solar system. And it may represent the future of Earth. Can you tell us about the instruments that will be on Envision? So the instruments are really designed to work together. Um, where, where this has come from is, is our experience in Earth observation, um, you know, using radar data, using infrared data, uh, and a whole host of other sorts of data types that we can get from orbit. And we're having to do that on one spacecraft because we don't have the budget for six, and make the observations that we need from orbit. The mission plans to launch in 2032. Venus is the closest planet to Earth, so the journey will only take seven months. But Envision needs to be in a low and almost circular orbit to use its instruments. To achieve this, it will use a technique called aerobraking, skimming through the upper atmosphere for a short time every orbit for 15 months to slow it down enough to insert it into the right orbit. It sounds crazy, but actually it's been done several times at Mars. It's been done at Venus before with Magellan um, and with Venus Express as, as a demonstration. 
We're launched on what's called an Ariane 6-2, uh, which can launch about 1,600 kilos to Venus. The spacecraft is designed to assist that process. So we have big solar panels and, and other features that help slow the spacecraft down. And that saves us an enormous amount of fuel. If we didn't do that, we'd need what's called a 6-4, which can send about three or four tons to Venus. But it's an order of magnitude, bigger rocket, more expensive, more fuel, everything else. So this saves us a huge amount of, of cost and time and effort. Once safely in orbit, the various instruments will start to take measurements. The imaging radar, Vensar, which is um, able to image the ground at high resolution, about 10 to 30 meters resolution, and give us those repeat measurements that tell us how the ground is changing. The 1990s NASA Magellan mission captured images of Venus' surface at 100 to 200 meters resolution. Envision will improve on this by providing images at 30 meter resolution and even higher on some areas of particular interest. We have a sounding radar, which um, you may have heard of, of or seen people dragging GPR units around the ground and probing the ground. And you can do that from orbit, and that's what this uh, subsurface sounder does. It gives us a sort of line profile into the subsurface across the planet, and that gives us an understanding of things like how thick a lava flows, where are the faults, that sort of thing. Taken together, the instruments will provide an interconnected set of data that they hope will yield more insights into our sister planet. It's the fact that we integrate them to try and understand better the processes and how they are interconnected. The coupling of geological processes with atmospheric through volcanism, for instance, and the cycling of uh, sulfur dioxide and other volatiles in the atmosphere. Um, so I think we're all really interested in the fact that these observations need to be considered together to really get an idea of the whole. Despite being an interplanetary mission supported by the European Space Agency, Envision runs on a relative shoestring. Both lead scientists have day jobs, and they'll need them for a while, because the data and images will only start returning to Earth in 2035. But forgive me, you might be nearing retirement by then. Why do you do it? Well, if it was easy, we would have done it already, wouldn't we? I mean, Mars is easy, let's face it. You know, it's got very little atmosphere. You can do all kinds of observations there. That, you know, that we, everything that we can do here, we can do there, more or less. Um, and uh, Venus is difficult. It's challenging to get there. It's in a, in, a, in a strange elliptical orbit. You know, sometimes it's very close, sometimes it's very far. There are many things on Venus which will be tremendously exciting to my colleagues who are focused very much on Earth. But many of them, quite understandably, say, oh, just, yeah, come and remind me in 10 years' time when you get there, you know, when you're on your way. And what is it that makes some people really doggedly stubborn, like ourselves? I don't know. I have a drive to, to show that, that Venus is active, that it's Earth-like, and, and I want the answers to these questions because I think they're really important. Um, but I also recognise that my career benefited from starting out on Magellan. And somebody in, in NASA proposed that mission, put effort into that mission and made it happen. And it took, took them 10 or 12 years to make that mission happen. And yes, they, they got to see the results, but really a whole swathe of other people benefited from it. So in some ways, I see this as my sort of payback and my personal legacy, if you like, that I'm giving something back to the community, but also I think I'm, I'm helping to sustain it into the future. <laughs> <laughs>